This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Create a beautiful website quickly without having to write a single line of code. The James Webb Space Telescope has found the strongest, most definitive evidence for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of an exoplanet 700 light years away. WASP-39b is a gas giant that orbits a sun-like star 700 light years away in the constellation Virgo. The planet orbits its star at a distance of just 0.05 AU. Now that's well inside Mercury's equivalent orbit around the Sun. At that distance, the planet's atmosphere is a scorching 1200 Kelvin. And that's hot enough to inflate the atmosphere by more than 50% of its normal size. So even though WASP-39b has the same mass as Saturn, its diameter is 30% larger than Jupiter. That's a big, puffy planet. The planet's orbit is tilted edge on to our line of sight, and that allows Webb to take its spectrum as it transits in front of its star. And the result is astonishing. It's the clearest, obvious, can't be anything else, no kidding signature of carbon dioxide ever seen in an exoplanet. The findings were made by the JWST Exoplanets Early Release Science Team and has been accepted for publication in Nature. Early Release Science, or ERS, is designed to do a bunch of science with Webb right after commissioning and release the data immediately to the public. And that way astronomers can understand just what Webb is really capable of and use that information to plan out future observations. So on the one hand, this result provides important insights into the composition and the formation of WASP-39b. But it also demonstrates Webb's ability to characterize the thinner atmospheres of smaller, rocky planets. Webb can do this because its near-infrared spectrometer has a special observation mode that was specifically designed to study the atmospheres of transiting exoplanets. And that allows Webb to produce what's called a transmission spectrum. Now, this technique is often described as subtracting the star spectrum from the star spectrum when the planet is in front of it, and whatever remains is the spectrum of the planet's atmosphere. However, transmission spectroscopy really isn't as simple as that. The real technique is actually quite different, and it's absolutely fascinating how they actually do it. So today we're going to learn how transmission spectroscopy works and how the early release science team determined that WASP-39b really does have carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. But first, I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Squarespace is designed to give you everything you need to get a new website up and running without having to write a single line of code. To get started, simply choose from one of the many mobile responsive templates and use their suite of built-in tools to upload your content. I've been working on a new website for our annual workshop for writers, and I love just how easy and intuitive it is. With its new Fluid Engine, I can move and resize elements and know that they'll always line up with the overall layout of the site. You can add any kind of content, whether it's photos, videos, newsletter signups, e-commerce, or virtually anything else you can imagine. Connect your social media accounts to display posts right on your website, and then share website content with your audience. Setting up a mailing list is a breeze. You start with an email template, apply your brand assets, and you're on your way. If you need a great website quickly, then you really need to check out squarespace.com slash launchpadastronomy for a free trial and save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. Webb observed WASP-39b on July 10th, just about a month after its near-spec instrument was fully commissioned. And during the transit, WASP-39b blocks about 2.5% of its star's light. And this shows up as a dip in the star's light curve. Now this is the same technique that Kepler and TESS use to detect exoplanets. But in order to know a planet's atmospheric composition, you really need to know how different colors or wavelengths of light are being blocked in different amounts. And that way you can work backward to figure out which gases have to be present in the atmosphere. And this is why Webb's near-spec instrument features a special observing mode called Bright Object Time Series, or BOTS. In BOTS mode, Webb takes a spectrum of the star once per minute. During the transit, the brightness of the star's spectrum drops. And that allows near-spec to effectively observe the transit in hundreds of wave bands, or colors, all at once. Now, because the observations took place over eight hours, near-spec generated something like 500 spectra. 
and that allowed the team to slice up the spectra into tiny little chunks or colors, and then plot the changes in those colors over time. The result is a unique light curve for each of NearSpec's wave bands. So here we're looking at some of those light curves, and they've all been artificially offset from each other so that we can see them individually. Now, apart from the fact that they are at different wavelengths, there really isn't any obvious difference in the shapes of the curves. But that's not really the case. If we combine some of these curves together, we can see some interesting differences. Light at 4.7 microns isn't getting blocked as much, while the light at 4.3 microns is blocked slightly more. We can really see the difference when we step through the individual light curves. Somewhere around 4.3 microns, we see the strongest dip in brightness, and this is followed by a slight recovery. If you plot out the amount of light blocked versus wavelength, the difference becomes even more clear. The vertical axis represents the percentage of light that's getting blocked, while the horizontal axis is wavelength. This is the transmission spectrum of WASP-39b, and that large bump right there is due to carbon dioxide absorbing light at 4.3 microns. It's essentially an inverted absorption spectrum, only instead of plotting the amount of star brightness versus wavelength, we're plotting star blockage versus wavelength. But still, how do we know that this particular absorption bump is due to carbon dioxide and not some other gas or multiple gases that are combining together to sort of masquerade as CO2? And that's why the ERS team ran several different algorithms to model what kinds of gases WASP-39b would need to have in order to produce the transmission spectrum we see here. Now, to see what role carbon dioxide is really playing here, the models were effectively rerun, only this time by not including a particular gas. They found that removing things like water, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, and methane didn't really change the fit to the large bump. But removing carbon dioxide effectively erases the bump from the model. So what the models are saying is, hey, if you want to have this bump right here, then you need to have carbon dioxide in the planet's atmosphere. And if you want to really fit the spectrum well, you also need water, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, and a little trace of methane. This is how we know that WASP-39b really has carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. And those models are making predictions about the rest of the atmosphere's composition that can be tested in future observations. But the models aren't perfect. The data shows a small but unmistakable bump at around 4 microns, and none of the models are predicting it. No matter how often they process the data, the ERS team could not seem to get rid of that little bump, so that suggests that there's some other gas in the planet's atmosphere that's adding in this extra absorption. So more work will be needed to tease out what this mysterious absorber is. Now to really appreciate just what a remarkable improvement this is, take a look at this transmission spectrum of WASP-39b that was created by the Spitzer Space Telescope. Astronomer Hannah Wakeford was able to get two measurements across two different wavelength ranges, and these measurements seem to kind of correlate with a model of carbon dioxide. But because of the way Spitzer's instruments were set up, it averages its measurements over those two broad wavelength ranges, and they're represented here by these two horizontal blue lines. The vertical bars indicate the uncertainty in the measurements. Now, Spitzer's measurements do seem to correlate with CO2 absorption, but it's really hard to draw a firm conclusion. But now with Webb, we have such precise data that we can really see a clean transmission spectrum. It turns out that Spitzer was in fact seeing carbon dioxide, only there was no way to know for sure until now. And by the way, this entire spectrum was captured in a single transit. With other telescopes, there's so much noise in the data that you typically have to observe several transits over many different days and even weeks at a time, and then average all of that data together to whittle away some of the noise and increase the signal. Webb took care of business in an afternoon. Now, this is all part of Webb's early release science program, so the data is immediately released to the public so astronomers can plan out those future observations. And those observations are not going to be limited to gas giants like WASP-39b. 
Webb's first year of observations include transmission spectroscopy of terrestrial planets, including those of the TRAPPIST-1 system. Now, naturally, this begs the question as to whether or not Webb could detect so-called biomarkers in a planet's atmosphere. Well, it certainly is true that on Earth, gases like molecular oxygen and methane are the byproduct of life. But those gases don't strictly require life to produce them either. Still, it'll be interesting to see if Webb can detect any of those gases in the atmospheres of terrestrial planets. Webb may have better success at detecting biomarkers in the atmospheres of so-called Hyshian planets. Hyshian planets are ocean worlds with enormous molecular hydrogen envelopes. There's some theoretical work that showed that if there was, in fact, life swimming around in these global oceans, they could expel enough biomarkers into the atmosphere for Webb to detect. I made a video about that, so feel free to check that out when we're done here. Otherwise, though, it's thought that Webb will probably identify some exoplanets that could possibly maybe host life, but it's unlikely that Webb should detect unambiguous signs of life. But then again, I wouldn't be surprised if we were surprised. A huge thanks, as always, to my patrons for helping to keep Launchpad Astronomy going. And if you'd like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours, well, please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, stay curious, my friend.